Don't cross the streams. Why? It would be bad. Total protonic reversal. Right, that's bad. Okay. All right, important safety tip. Thanks, Egan. You know, Ghostbusters was kind of uh, unusual in that it was one of the first epic scale comedies. If there's a steady paycheck in it, I'll believe anything you say. You know, we did two movies. We spent um, almost a year, you know, all total working together. I think everybody realized what original material it was. Hello, Ghostbusters. The way Dan described the Ghostbusters, it was we were like Orkin, man. And we were no more impressed by these apparitions and manifestations than you would be by uh, an outbreak of ants or roaches in your kitchen. I'm Walter Peck. Great, how's it going now? Well, you have the comic geniuses of our, of our generation, and they've known each other for years, and they're hysterical. It's the Stay Puft Marshmallow Man. When we look back at our library and we think of what has, you know, premium value and, and what the fans love, it's always been, in our minds, Ghostbusters. The wonderful thing about the movies is they hold up after all this time. But now we're in a different place. Gaming has been moved to a whole other dimension, and it gives the fans something that they've been waiting for. In film, it's kind of tough to break that fourth wall and turn to the audience and say, come with me. Now the audience and the player are one. The game format enables us to actually include the Ghostbusters viewing audience. Ghostbusters is the video game I've always wanted to make since I've been in the industry, and I've only waited till the technology met up with what the movie could do before I started it. We came, we saw, we kicked its ass! Bill Atherton is back as Walter Peck, the EPA guy. Annie Potts is back as Janine, and, and then all the Ghostbusters is Ernie Hudson, Danny, me, and Bill Murray. Having Dan Aykroyd makes the game. Having Bill Murray, having, you know, Harold Ramis and Ernie Hudson, that makes the game. I mean, you have to have Janine answering the phone at Ghostbusters headquarters. I mean, you can't have someone else do that. Ghostbusters, what do you want? My character has, it feels like as we record the dialogue that my character has a lot of instructions. Egon is the logical, systematic one. I didn't realize I had so many memorable lines until 25 years later somebody will go, that's a big Twinkie. That's a big Twinkie. Bill Murray's character, Venkman, kind of holds down that kind of dry, uh, skeptical, mundane quality. And that makes for a lot of comedy. It's right here, Ray. It's looking at me. He's an ugly little spud, isn't he? I think he can hear you, Ray. If, if there was a movie script as long as a game script, the film would be, it would be like all the Lord of the Rings films strung together. <laughs> it's about a thousand pages because you have to cover all these alternatives. Uh, when I first heard about it, I thought, okay, well, you know, maybe it will be different, but all the characters really ring true. It looks more like the sequel than a game. It tells the third story. You know, I watched the first two movies uh, in preparation for it and uh, parking back to that enthusiasm that I had when I, when I first wrote it. When Dan announced that, you know, he and Harold would actually love to write the script, that you're like, ah, because you're worried, you know, can we pull off the comedy of those first two films? Well, now we have the script writers from those films. This chapter of Ghostbusters takes place in 1991, two years after Ghostbusters 2, because uh, they like, wanted enough time to pass where things can settle down from the last movie. I've always wanted a marine component to the, uh, the Ghostbusters, so in the game, there might be structures uh, in and around the river outside Manhattan Island. Without giving too much away, certainly has that. Well, for the story of the game, they, they have this, the, the great device of this uh, mandala with uh, nodes that represent different focal points of turbulence in the city. We're paying the Ghostbusters very well through these city contracts. That's the way it works now, yeah like the sanitation department, the police department, the fire department. It was always to be such, you know, that, uh, that Ghostbusters were to be an essential sanitation arm of, of living in, in urban, urban life. The city had taken out a insurance policy against the Ghostbusters, so everything's billed to the city directly. But with all this destruction they're doing around town, the bills are getting quite enormous. So the, the mayor hires Peck as a paranormal oversight committee. So he's there to check the books to make sure the Ghostbusters are doing everything properly. And every time you destroy, destroy something in the game, he's going to be in your face. Never done a game. So, um, it was all new. I am Walter Peck, sir, and I'm prepared to make a full report. These men are consummate snowball artists. <laughs> it's, it's hard to get rid of old Peck. The most intense thing that happens to him now is that he becomes possessed. And my first official act is going to be suspending these idiots' operating license. Yeah, they needed a, a average-looking Joe Blow off the street to play the rookie character, and I um, successfully campaigned for that spot. You'll recognize the back of my ears really well. <laughs> well, the player is a, is a cadet. He's a rookie. He joins the Ghostbusters, and uh, there's there are new problems at the library. There's museum problems. The Hotel Sedgwick makes another appearance. Certain familiar entities uh, 
recur in the places where they where they first appeared in in the film. So Stay Puft Marshmallow and back on the streets of New York, Slimer's back in the hotel, uh, which is a nice kind of callback to uh, it may evoke a little nostalgia in the in the player. All of the equipment and all of the locations and all of the characters and everything are absolutely eye-popping in this game. So it's done with real affection for the original concept. We're just able to go places that, that we weren't able to go in the movies. It really is, to me, the third movie. The elements of the supernatural allow you to create monsters and creatures that are visually really interesting and um, all kinds of tools and weapons that are the staples of, of video gaming. The game, it's funny, the interiors are a lot more vivid than, than, than a film, and, and then the, the exteriors, and we get to take advantage of the streets, the river, the buildings, and go places where you just couldn't go in a movie, you know. The gameplay in this game is unique. You're shooting a proton pack that's nuclear charged that should blow up in a three mile radius, and, and using it to wrangle ghosts. And, and it's more of a, you're not shooting to destroy, you're shooting to capture. So this is the first game you're out there and you're wrangling things and moving them around into a trap. You're trapping beings. If you were going to either trap ectoplasm or trap a full material uh, apparition, you'd have to do it on a subatomic particulate level. You'd need some pretty sophisticated equipment. I figure it would cost about $90 billion to build the, you know, actually build a prototype of one of those things. Dan immediately came back and told us, no, they need to be called this, this, and this. And he had definite technical terms. Bosons are their inner parts of the atomic structure, and uh, they're very elusive, you know, like mesons, muons, gluons. You know, there's a whole science now that's, that tries to trap these invisible particles. Uh, it's very dangerous playing with this stuff. Throw it! I did that! I did that! That's my fault! It's okay, the table broke the fall. Composite particle system is similar to a distillery in the, in the field of making uh, corn liquor. What you're doing is you're doing an original collision, and then you're basically forcing it back through a, a, a filter, but it forces them back through where they've already been, and then out through your wand. Yeah. Again, very expensive equipment. Very, very expensive. You know, it's just occurred to me we really haven't had a completely successful test of this equipment. I blame myself. So do I. I have no sense worrying about it now. Why worry? Each of us is wearing an unlicensed nuclear accelerator on his back. When we set out to work with the developer, we interviewed actually quite a few, and Terminal Reality came in with a demo that quite honestly blew us away. Infernal Engine, um, our in internal engine here at Terminal Reality, really, really allows us to create a living, breathing world, so to speak. We can put literally thousands of objects moving in through the environment at once. Uh, you can blow apart things. I mean, pretty much in a video game, you have to have walls, a floor, and a ceiling. Other than that, everything's fair game to be destroyed in Ghostbusters. In Ghostbusters, the video game, there's a lot of different equipment that the player has at their disposal. Um, we've kind of taken the traditional proton stream and we've added some elements to it. If this was a movie, there wouldn't be the level of environmental destruction. We kind of go above and beyond. All the crowds, all the individual people actually have their own AI. There's no flocking AI. It's not hurting. I think one of the biggest challenges of working on this game is everybody wants this to be a great game, and then we bring to that the burden of knowing that gamers out there want this to be a great game. One of the nice things about our engine is the way it handles physics. So we were able to take our boss fights and there's some, some boss fights in there where they actually use the environment against you. You know, this looks solid, this looks solid, this all looks solid, everything looks solid around us, but it's not solid at all. It's a seething mass of atoms. You know, you've got your nucleus and protons and electrons, and uh, you've got your paths around the nucleus, and then what's in between those paths and the, and the nucleus, but space, matter, the same dark space that's out in, in the universe that we see, you know, between the stars. And antimatter is a large part of what was created at the Big Bang. And in Ghostbusters, you know, we were able to use that and put it into the positive world in, in, in the service of, you know, cleaning, cleaning out uh, pesky spirits and stuff. So our objective from the very beginning with this game is that every minute of this game needs to be either fun, funny, or scary. And being a Ghostbuster, which is the ultimate experience we could deliver to a player. In this game, much like the movies, uh, the player is going to be uh, experiencing the uh, equipment on the fly. Uh, Ghostbusters tend to go by the seat of their pants and they don't often have much prep time. Slime Tether masters plasma and masters the plasma energy in the multiverse everywhere. So and enables the operator to hold on to entities that would go back to the dimension they came from or vanish. They can't do it if once the slime tether touches them. Think of it as a, 
I guess, the glue on the bottom of a fly's, uh, you know, foot. It's that kind of viscous, almost, a, almost like a psychically viscous material. My God is the question. Uh, no, but if asked, I always say I'm a God. Yeah. Are you a God? No. Then. Yeah. We've actually managed to surprise most people at the end. There is a twist ending where people are actually taken aback. I do feel the fans have been looking for something else, you know, ever since we did the second one. We felt like of all the movies that we have, this definitely is a video game. It's a, a special moment for all the Ghostbusters fans that have been wanting another storyline for Ghostbusters for 20 years and to get the talent back together, to get the band back together, to get Sony willing to say yes. It's a perfect storm with the right engine, right license, and right talent. Get her! <laughs> Thank mm -hmm. you.